Actually, Tamar is right. I purposely chose a vague uh, title for today's talk. Uh, we tend to think about post-Zionism as being a modern phenomena. And what I'm going to try to show is that already 2,000 years ago, the question of the role of the land of Zion, Zion, uh, comes up. And it comes up in interesting ways and is constantly being reinterpreted. And there's no one camp that has control over the phrase. We'll see this in a few minutes. Now, there's one misconception that I'd like to correct at the very beginning of our talk today. We tend to think that the destruction of the Second Temple in the year 70, the Churban, led to the dispersion of the Jewish people. In Hebrew, we refer to Altaim Shnot Galut, the 2,000 years of, uh, of exile. Two things, however, kind of qualify or temper that assumption. First of all, Jews were dispersed around much of the Mediterranean area before the destruction of the Second Temple period. And in fact, during much of the, uh, this, uh, of the Second Temple period, there was a very, uh, not just a, a wide um, diaspora, but an assertive one, a, a, a definitely Jewish identified diaspora. So the Chorban did not cause, was not the first um, uh, reason for the dispersion of the Jews, the second Churma. And the other point I would make is that the year 70, the year of the destruction, did not bring about a mass deportation of Jews uh, outside, to, outside of the land of Israel. The fact is that the Romans, both in 70 and even after the Bar Kokhba War, did not uh, introduce some sort of mass deportation. And the Jewish community in the land of Israel remained probably the dominant ethnic community for a few more centuries. And archaeology has proven this beyond a doubt. If we go up, travel around the land, uh, we get a sense of a vibrant community, a powerful community. Look at the impressive archaeological remains that we discovered that were, that were built hundreds of years after the destruction, the massive or, or large number of very impressive synagogues throughout the land. So that's not the point. My point, however, both before the year 70 and after, is not was there a dispersion, but what was the role of the land in the Jewish psyche? How did people relate to the land? Yes, now we know there was the second temple and people sent funds to the temple and they came on pilgrimage, but I'm not talking about the temple per se. I'm talking about Zion, Eretz Yisrael, was there any sense of a commitment to the land of Israel? This is the question. Uh, I'll give you an example of why this question comes up. We all know that with the founding of the state of Israel, and even prior to that, uh, with the appearance of the Zionist uh, enterprise, and uh, I would say the strengthening of the Zionist enterprise through um, much of the 20th century, even before the founding of the state, but certainly since 1948, with the founding of a state, we hear calls for Aliyah. In other words, right, people, now that there is a Jewish state, there is good reason to come on Aliyah. Uh, and not only that, we hear during the first year, or I would say even after the first years of the founding of the state of Israel, all sorts of derogatory, certainly in Israel, we used to hear, and I hope much less today, but somewhat derogatory references to people who left the land of Israel. The, uh, in Hebrew, the Yorudim, and there were all sorts of nasty comments about them being dropouts or weaklings, etc. One of them even uh, made by a very famous uh, uh, statesman of, in the state of Israel. Now, what is interesting is that during the Second Temple period, there was also a state, the Hasmonean state, uh, that existed for a good many years. And it is striking that nowhere during the Second Temple period do we hear calls for Aliyah. In other words, we do not encounter uh, either letters or calls emanating from the land of Israel to the Jews of the diaspora saying, now that we have a revitalized center in the land of Israel, you should join us, you should be here with us and not abroad. And uh, the question will be why, why we don't hear this. But more, or more than that, how is the existence of Jews abroad justified? 
And was this already a slackening of the relationship with uh, Zion? And these are some of the issues that we're going to discuss today. Uh, and even the meaning of the word Zion, we're going to find uh, undergoes a very interesting change. In fact, I'd like to show you one example of a uh, very early example. This takes us back to biblical times, to the days of the prophets, the end and the end of the first temple period, how there seems to be a reformulation of the image of the centrality of Zion. If you look at your sources here, and if we go to the first and second sources on the first page, source number one from Isaiah 2-3 is arguably uh, the most famous and the most frequently quoted reference to Zion, to Zion. Kemi Zion teitzei Torah udvar Hashem Yerushalayim, for out of Zion shall come forth Torah and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now something very interesting happens. If we scroll down Isaiah from chapter two towards the very, almost the very end of uh, Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 51, we find uh, that very first scripture totally reformulated. It is no longer for out of Zion shall come forth Torah, but God says, the prophet uh, uh, informs us, Torah shall come forth from me. And now this is striking. There are, in, in both cases, we're talking about four words, a four word statement. Three of the words are exactly the same. The words key, and the word teitze and the word Torah appear in both of those quotations. But in the second one, Torah does not come forth from Zion anymore, but from me, meaning from God. And one of my colleagues at the Hebrew University, Professor Michael Siegel, has a fascinating article where he discusses this. And he claims that uh, the second scripture was produced after the first uh, expulsion and captivity of Jews abroad. And he claims that the exiles and the prophet found themselves far away from Zion. And therefore the message of Isaiah 2.23, according to which the teaching the word of God comes specifically from Jerusalem, from Zion, became problematic. And so the reformulation of Isaiah 2.3 informs the exiles that they need not be alarmed at their distance from the central locus Jerusalem. The dispensing of justice and divine instruction is not a function of the temple's location, but rather of the presence of God in that or any other location. This is fascinating because it suggests that rather than land, territory, geography, geography be the focal point of Jewish learning and Jewish knowledge and dispens dispensation of Torah, uh, the center is now a spiritualized center. It is not a geographical one. It's not territory, but rather a spiritual center, a spiritual image that can uh, be found anywhere in the world. This set the tone for something very interesting. And now what I'm going to do, and you'll forgive me if I jump forward in history uh, from the days of Isaiah till the ninth century of the common era, and what a put you, uh, tell you a small story about something that was discovered just in the end of the 19th century. We found letters, uh, scholars found letters in the Cairo Geniza, that famous repository of documents uh, from the early Middle Ages. And in the Cairo Geniza, we found letters that were written in the ninth century by a Babylonian scholar. He was a disciple of Rashi Yeshivot, of heads of Yeshivot. His name was Pirkoi ben Baboy, right? And the letters have a fantastic, a striking uh, message uh, to be delivered. He writes to the diaspora. He's writing from Babylonia, most probably from Baghdad already, but he's writing to the uh, diaspora, telling them that they should accept only Babylonian Torah authority, the authority for dispensing not just the knowledge, but the legal requirements of the Torah, that knowledge can only be found in Babylonia and no longer in the land of Israel. But he takes this a step further because he's going to quote scripture. And one of the scriptures uses the word Zion, but in a very strange way. If you look at source number three, he writes that even in the days of the Messiah, meaning 
They, Babylonian jury, will not witness the pre-Messianic tribulations. We, according to the rabbis, there will be also, maybe even according to the Bible, we all sorts of uh, terrible events that precede the Messianic appearance. And what is his proof text? For it is written, De deliver yourself, O Zion, that dwellest with the daughter of Babylon. Now, when the prophet Zechariah made that statement, his clear intention, and nobody doubts this, is that he was telling those of Israel that now are in Babylonia, Zion meaning the people of Israel, now that dwellest, you Israelites that dwell in Babylon, deliver yourself to Zion. And it's interesting that the Septuagint in Greek actually translates to Zion, deliver yourself. The prophet was telling Jews in the diaspora and in Babylonia in particular in this case, go back to the land of Israel. What does Pirkoi do? He turns this on its head and he interprets it, continue reading here, deliver yourself from evil Edom. Now Edom is Rome and Rome does not rule in Babylonia. Rome rules, at least in Talmudic times, in the land of Israel. Rome could be Christian Rome or, or even earlier pagan Rome. And so it's as if the prophet was telling the Israelites to remove themselves from the land of Israel and from its galut. So now, if you're in Israel, you're in galut, right? Ah, but he knows that people will bring the proof text from Isaiah. Kimitzion say Torah. And now he says something that is striking. Zion is not a land. Zion is not a geographic center. And Zion is none other than the yeshiva, where they are outstanding. Him metsuyanim in Torah and mitzvot. Um, this not only turns the prophet on its head, on his head, but in fact render Zion no longer a reference to a particular territory, geographical center, but rather to a spiritual center. So it's somewhat like what we saw in the book of Isaiah, right? That movement from Zion to Meiti. Uh, Pirkoi, however, was following a long, and we'll get back to this, a long Babylonian tradition that basically will claim, bottom line will claim what what designates, what defines Judaism is its Torah. And wherever the center of Torah is located, that is the center of the Jewish people. It is not a geographical term anymore, right? Sion is where they excel or outstanding in Torah. As I say, this is striking because it tells us, if we go a little further, we'll find that all sorts of comparisons are made between diaspora and the land of Israel. And sometimes the diaspora is the equal of the land of Israel. Number four in front of you, Rav Yehuda, a sage in Babylonia, very end of the third century. Rav Yehuda says, one who lives in Babylonia, it is as if he lived in the land of Israel. In other words, there's nothing unique to uh, the land of Israel. If you live in Babylonia, it's the same. And he quotes the same scripture, and I suspect that our friend Pirkoi took the scripture from him, deliver yourself, O Zion, again, thou that dwellest with the daughter of Babylon. So there seems to be a parallel here, Zion and Babylon, hence the two are the same. But if I'm really going to talk about post-Zionism in the Second Temple period already, I'd like to quote, I think, two prime examples of Jewish authors, thinkers. Uh, these are not just, uh, your average man on the street. These were people who were well-versed in Jewish tradition. And both of them articulate what can almost be called a post-Zionism uh, mentality. Certainly Josephus, but possibly Philo, the famous Alexandrian Jewish um, philosopher as well. Number, source number five, it's an, I find one of the most fascinating sources. Philo there deals in his book, The Life of Moses, with the phrase that we call Pesach Sheni. According to the Bible, there uh, were a few people who could not partake of the Passover sacrifice in the days of the Exodus because they were impure. And later on, there might be other cases where they were far removed from uh, the altar, from 
the holy site where the sacrifice was offered. And so they approach Moses and they ask him, do we have a second chance? Pesach Sheni, in other words, do we have a second chance to offer up a Passover sacrifice? And Moses ultimately, after referring the question actually to God at first, uh, says, yes, they do have a second chance. It'll come a month after the first Passover. But then he elaborates the same permission to have Pesach Sheni, a second Passover, also must be given to those who were prevented from joining the whole nation in worship, not by mourning. In other words, not only because they were in mourning and they may have come into contact with a corpse, which rendered them impure, but they were granted this permission by, because they were absent in a distant country. Now that's fairly close to the book of Numbers, they were far away. But Philo takes this much further. For settlers abroad and inhabitants of other regions are not wrongdoers. This is striking. There's absolutely no hint in, in the books of Moses that we're talking about settlers abroad. Moses is talking about people who are in the desert. And Philo tell, talks to us about, uh, about Brooklyn, New York, right? Settlers abroad, right? Uh, or Alexandria, as the case may be. Set, but he says Philo, and here I, I suspect that Philo is looking over his shoulder and he knows that there are two types of communities that might look, ask might look askance at his presence and the presence of many, many Jews abroad and specifically in a place like Alexandria. Those two communities would be some, possibly, I don't know if he received letters from his family in Jerusalem, if he had a family in Jerusalem, uh, telling him, what are you doing in Alexandria? Why don't you come on Aliyah? And he probably also uh, had heard all sorts, behind his back, all sorts of nasty remarks from Greeks living in Alexandria, aimed at Jews, because Jews were considered to be uh, foreigners. You come from elsewhere, what are you doing here? And Philo seeks to answer both of those claims in one sentence. For settlers abroad and inhabitants of other regions are not wrongdoers who deserve to be, to be deprived of equal privileges, particularly if the nation has grown so populous that a single country cannot contain it. That's a fascinating phrase. Because what Philo is doing is pulling out the rug from Jews who might be attacking him for living abroad. And what he's saying is, I'm here because God promised our father Abraham that your seed, your, your offspring, your, your sons would be like the stars and like the sand, uh, right? On the, uh, beyond counting, right? And God fulfilled his promise to the utmost. We are so numerous that one land one's country cannot contain us. In other words, this is a sign, the fact that we're living abroad and not just in the land of Israel is a sign of God's favor, right? Of, uh, of his keeping his promise. But then he changes gears and he says, hey, yes, and we're also here because the nation has sent out colonies in all directions. This was a brilliant choice of words because Philo could have told his Greek uh, neighbors in Alexandria, you know, you say, we don't belong here. How long have you been here? You're not the indigenous population. You arrived here with Alexander the Great. You come from elsewhere. So what are you doing spread around? But of course, their answer would have been, ah, but we spread culture through what? Through the founding of colonies. And this is a choice word. Colonies, apoikia in Greek, means colony. But the, the idea is not just numbers of people moving from one site to another, but rather of the dispersion of a culture through these colonies. And so what Philo was saying to his Greek neighbor is, we're no different from you. We also founded colonies where we dispense culture of a sort, right? So here, Philo is justifying diaspora existence. He doesn't undermine living in the land of Israel, but he says that there is absolutely nothing wrong being a, quote, a, a yore, right? Or being someone who lives in the diaspora reality uh, is totally legitimate and maybe even a sign of God's beneficence, of God's uh, having uh, fulfilled his promises. Josephus takes this a step further. And in his book, The Antiquities, now remember, Philo was writing during the Second Temple period. Josephus wrote his book, Antiquities, 
um, a number of years after the destruction of the Second Temple. And he, I can already tell you, this is a paraphrase of the story of Balaam. You all remember Balaam was hired to curse the people of Israel. Uh, he just did not succeed. And what should have been a curse winds up being a blessing. And among the things that Balaam tells that, uh, the, the people that hired him and Israel itself, uh, according to Josephus' paraphrase is striking. That land to which he himself has sent you, in other words, this is Balaam talking to the people of Israel, that land you shall surely occupy. I, you know, in modern times, I think we would have maybe chosen another word in English, but that's not our problem today. You will surely occupy that land that he sent you to, and ye shall suffer, suffer for the world to furnish every land with inhabitants from your race. In other words, you will spread out everywhere. Now he goes even further. For the whole habitable world, be sure, lies before you as an eternal habitation. Now this is interesting. The word eternal is important here. Philo, elsewhere in one of his books, nevertheless believed in some sort of ingathering, some sort of return to Zion, excuse me, to Zion. Josephus basically says that with the year 70, the whole uh, nature of Jewish existence has changed. You now will provide inhabitants for the whole world, and, you will, and that whole world will be your eternal habitation, and your multitudes shall find abode on islands and continent more numerous than even the stars in heaven. In my mind, this is already a post-Zionist uh, 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 proclamation by Josephus. What they, and we, we can show this elsewhere in Josephus' writings. Basically, Josephus claims that with the destruction, we have become uh, what much later scholars would refer to as Am Olam, a nation of the world. In other words, we're, not, we're, not, we're no longer con uh, confined nor even defined by our connection to a land. Now, this is important because you die or Jews up until this stage, right, were defined as you die or people coming from Judea. But as we will see a bit further on today, towards the end of our talk, uh, very slowly, the Romans will change that concept in their mind from Jews being from the land of Judea to Jews who are of a particular religion, right? who live as Jews, even though they live in Rome or elsewhere. And this is a major departure that we'll have to address. But both Philo and Josephus would claim that you can live abroad. And there's not, not only there's nothing wrong, you can thrive abroad, and Josephus actually says this. The rabbis in the land of Israel were aware of this, quote, post-Zionist approach, and tried to, uh, to, to reply, to respond, and to disprove that mentality in a number of ways. One of them was to say, look, you may think you can live abroad, uh, but you won't be able to assimilate there. It'll, it'll be impossible for Jews as Jews to assimilate outside uh, of the land, and the rabbis will bring proof. If we look, for, for instance, at source number seven and eight, uh, Galta Yehuda, the book of uh, Echav Lamentations, Judah has gone into, Ezra, into exile, Galta Yehuda, to which the Midrash, the Midrash of Eretz Israel says, Judah has gone into ex exile? Do not the nations of the world go into exile? What's unique here? This is the way of the world. Different nations are conquered, they're sent in, or they go into exile. What's unique here? But the Midrash goes further. The fact is, that though they go into exile, meaning the nations of the world go into exile, their exile is not really exile. The heathen nations who eat their bread, their bread means local bread. I can tell you that the word bread in rabbinic terminology is sometimes used as a metaphor for uh, sexual relations as well. But nevertheless, the nations can eat local bread wherever they live and drink their wine. Hence, they can assimilate. They have no problem behaving like the indigenous population. Hence, their exile is not real exile. But Israel, 
who do not eat their bread, and this could again be a reference to the fact that they can't marry or drink their wine, right? They experience true exile. In other words, what the rabbis here were saying is that you, the, the cosmopolitan type Jew of Alexandria or even of Rome, such as Josephus ultimately, uh, is kidding himself if he really believes that Jews can remain Jews and assimilate at the same time and become part of the large oikumene, that is the civilized world. There's another beautiful midrash that makes this point where you may think you can assimilate, but it won't work. Uh, one of the famous uh, long, long chapters that deals with the ultimate punishment if the people of Israel do not behave, the tochecha, right, uh, also says, this is source number eight, and among these nations, in other words, you will be dispersed among the nations, and among these nations, thou shalt have no rest. There will be no rest for the sole of your foot. Lo ye manoach lekaf baglecha. And the rabbis have a very keen ear for words. And they remember that, that uh, th those words bunched together, manoach lekaf haregel, rest for the sole of your foot, appears in one other place in the books of Moses, and that, of course, in the book of Genesis, where Noah sends forth a dove. This is source number nine. But the dove found no rest for the sole of its foot. The same phrase, lo matzah yonam manoach lekaf ragla. Ah, so what did the dove do? Because it found no rest for the sole of its foot, and so it returned to him, meaning to Noah, to the ark. And now we have, of course, the, con the conclusion of this midrash, the underlying message is we're not towing, talking about doves and Noah's ark, we're talking about something else. Rabbi Judah bar Nachman in the name of Resh Lakish said, so we're talking third century Eretz Yisrael, had it found a place of rest, had the dove found a place of rest, it would not have returned, right? It would have stayed there. And of course, the allusion is to source number eight, you too, meaning the people of Israel who will be sent abroad will have no rest for the sole of your feet. Hence, like the dove, ultimately you will have to return. So here we have one approach that counters the idea of a, a post-Zionist uh, Jewish uh, Hellenistic or Hellenized existence abroad. The rabbis, of course, would take this a step further. We're going another direction. Not only will you not succeed in assimilating, it's forbidden. And here we have a whole series of laws. And what is striking is none of these laws precede the Bar Kokhba war. They are all post Bar Kokhba. So it's strange. We don't hear of any requirement to live in the land while there was still a state before the year 70. After the Bar Kokhba, after 135, suddenly we begin to hear right, uh, all sorts of uh, legal reasons forbidding existence of Jews abroad. And so in source number 10, a person should always live in the land of Israel, even in a town in which the majority of residents are Gentiles. And this is clearly a post Bar Kokhba reality where certain towns, in fact, were now overtaken by non Jewish populations, uh, and especially in the southern part of the country. And uh, one, when we're, one is told here, you, you must remain in the land even when the majority of residents in a town are Gentiles, and you cannot live abroad in, even in a town in which all the residents are Israelites. This ultimately will be a reference to Babylonia because there were some Babylonian towns where we get the impression that the vast majority of the residents were in fact Jewish. And so this teaches that living in the land of Israel is weighed against or is equal to all the commandments of the Torah. And these laws now begin to appear constantly emanating, even when they're quoted in the Babylonian Talmud, they all come from the land of Israel. And here we read in source number 11, Whoever lives in the land of Israel may be considered to have a God. Whoever lives outside of the land may be regarded as one who has no God. Why? For it says in scripture, I am the Lord your God, who brought you forth out of the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan to be your God. It's a package deal. If you don't accept the land of Canaan, I will not be your God. So here again, right, we, we encounter a, 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 a statement that negates, totally negates the uh, 
the uh, acceptable uh, process of Jews living abroad, moving abroad, even in dire circumstances, right? Uh, one must remain in the land. Uh, and then we hear some very extreme statements of, uh, about those people who either were contemplating leaving the land or who had already left. And source number 13 is just one of a number of stories that makes this point. The story is a certain Kohen, a priest, approached Rabbi Hanina Bar Chama. Here we are again, third century, with the following question. My brother passed away, leaving a childless widow. Now you know, if one's brother Pat dies and leaves a widow without a child, the law of leveret marriage, ye boom, uh, requires that the surviving brother marry his sister-in-law, the widow sister-in-law. And here we have a fellow approaching the rabbi, probably in the city of Sepphoris, Sipori, and, said, and he tells him a story. My brother just died. He left a childless widow. Is it permissible to leave the land for Tyre, Tzor, in the Lebanon to perform a mitzvah, either of leveret marriage, meaning marrying this woman, Ibo, or Halitza, releasing the widow from her bond to me. Uh, now, if we put this in, in a proper geographical and historical context, how long does it take to go from Galilee to Tyre? We're talking about a matter of hours, right, to go from the Galilee into southern Lebanon. Marry the woman, maybe bring her back with you. But this is a cardinal mitzvah to, re to release this woman from her bonds, right? Because if she's neither um, uh, married by the brother, leveret marriage, or given chalitza, in other words, released, She's in limbo, she can't, her life is no longer uh, a life. She can't marry, she has no support. And so this is a cardinal mitzvah. And so he asks the rabbi, can I go abroad? Can I go to Chutz Laaretz for a matter of hours to marry this woman or to release her from her bond to me? And the rabbi answers, we would have hoped from a little more empathy maybe from the rabbi, but the answer is striking. Your brother left the land. Blessed is God that killed him. Do you wish to follow in his steps? And some say, he replied, your brother abandoned his mother's bosom, chet imo, embraced a foreign bosom, chet nukhriya. Blessed is God that killed him. Do you wish to follow in his steps? Right? That this is striking. In other words, here is a person who wants to perform what we consider to be a cardinal mitzvah, but it, is, it involves a at least temporary leaving of the land. And the rabbi, who, by the way, it's interesting, Hanina Bahama is an ole from Babylonia. So maybe he has this extreme uh, bent to him, right? He's the great champion of Eretz Israel, and he performed Aliyah uh, by himself already. And so he refuses to sanction somebody leaving the land, even for, for, good, for good reason. If we skip down from source number 13, I want to read another example. Uh, source number 15, we get another sense of how the rabbis of the land of Israel related to Jews who didn't come on Aliyah, or at least in their lifetime did not come on Aliyah. And the response that we hear again in the Israel Midrash, Palestinian Midrash, Genesis Rabbah, right, uh, I think sheds light on the tense relationship between the rabbis of Eretz Israel, who sensed that there was an element of what I called post-Zionism, that is to say where Zion no longer is the ultimate requirement, right, uh, and the ultimate center, uh, and opposed it in any way they could. Now, as you know, there was a custom uh, I wrote about a, an article about this 50, 50 years ago uh, on the background of the development of the custom of bringing the dead for reinterment to the land of Israel. People that died abroad and either they asked upon their deathbed or, or, or in their uh, last wills and testament or possibly the family wanted to bring the bodies for burial. I can tell you I did this with my parents as well. Uh, they wanted to bring the burial to the land of Israel. Uh, the rabbis, by the way, gave at least two reasons for wanting to be buried in the land of Israel. Uh, 
One belief was that those buried in the land would be the first to rise up in the Messianic era. And the other is that one who is buried in the land of Israel has his or her sins atoned for. V'chiper admato amo, the Adama, the land, will atone, v'chiper, the nation. And so there begins to appear a custom, and if you go to, those of you who are in Israel should visit Beit Sha'arim as the perfect example, the prime example of people from abroad who were brought for reburial to the land of Israel. And we read about source number 15, we read about two rabbis, Rabbi Bar Koraya and Rabbi Elazar, were sitting and studying Torah in the Elasis of Tiberias. There are all sorts of uh, uh, explanations for that strange word. Elasis might be a glass factory. It seems to be an area just outside the gates, the old gates of the city of Tiberias. And by the way, uh, archaeologists actually uncovered this big Roman uh, theater outside of uh, Tiberius on the road going it's on your right if you're driving south and near there there's also a major gate and you can see the wall of the city and the gate and apparently they're sitting there and they see coffins arriving from abroad and now listen to this first rabbi and you get a sense of how tense the issue is said rabbi Bar Koraya to Rabbi Elazar regarding these meaning these people being brought for reburial in uh, the, land, the land. Regarding these, I apply the verse in Jeremiah. In your lifetime, you made my possession abhorrent. In your lifetime, in Hebrew, nachlati samtem to'eva, my possession meaning my land. You had no use for the land in your lifetime and in your death. Now comes the striking statement, in your death, you came and defiled my land. Sending dead bodies defiles the land, right? Uh, we know that a dead body is, is, is cause for impurity, for defiling. But what they seem to be saying is, we don't need dead bodies. And if you send that dead bodies, it's not only that you did not come to the land in your lifetime, you had no use for the land in your lifetime. So here you have a, a, a definite response to this idea that there's no real active required commitment to the land. And here this rabbi says, if you don't come, uh, you're defiling the land upon reburial. His friend qualifies this, of course. He, Rabbi Elazar, said to him, not so. When they come to the land of Israel, they place upon them, meaning upon uh, either the coffin or the, or the corpse itself, a lump of earth, thus atoning for their sins. On what basis is this assertion made? And the land doth make expiation for his people, meaning that uh, the land will uh, bring about expiation for sins for those who are buried therein. And so what we have here is uh, a reflection of some sort of tense uh, reality between the rabbis living in the land who are aware of this process that slowly people are defining Zion as being Mitsuyanim b'Torah, yes, Babylonia has great Torah scholars, right? But it's no longer Tzion. At least this is what one of the rabbis said. And you're dismissing Tzion by sending dead bodies here. His friend tries to qualify this. Now, by the way, this had all sorts of ramifications. If you look very quickly at um, source number, where are we here? Yes. Uh, source number 14, uh, the question probably arose uh, uh, within families. He, uh, number 14, he, the husband, desires to come to Eretz Israel, and she, the wife, does not wish to come, right? They want to make, he wants to make Aliyah, she doesn't want to. She is coerced to come. Now comes something interesting. If she wishes to come to the land of Israel, from, and he does not, according to one of the manuscripts, he is coerced to come. And this, like, according to the other one, he is not. And I suspect that the Erfurt manuscript just couldn't imagine, right, that uh, she, the wife, overrules the husband in any matter of family disputes. And yet, apparently, the halakha says that the land of Israel takes precedence even to a relationship between husband and wife. 
And there are cases where if the woman wants to come, and if you look a little further down, if she wishes to go up to the land and he refuses, he is coerced to go up. And if he refuses, he must divorce her and it costs him money as well and pay her ketubah. But I'd like to show you the different approaches in the land of Israel and in the center to this idea of Zion of Zion. So if you go very, very quickly to source number, uh, well, first of all, source number 60. Source number 16, I, I, I have a somewhat personal relationship to. The story is told, you'll see why in a second, Rabbi Zera was avoiding Rabbi Yehuda. This is a story that takes place in the land Babylonia. Zera is a young student in the yeshiva in Babylonia. His Rosh Yeshiva is Rabbi Yehuda. Zera wished to go up to the land of Israel and Rabbi Yehuda told, his Rosh Yeshiva said, all who go up from, Abilo, from Babylonia to the land of Israel transgress a positive command. Transgress? It's forbidden to go on Aliyah? It's a positive command, right? This, of course, sounds like uh, Satmar uh, ideology. For it says in Jeremiah, they shall be carried to Babylon and there they will remain until I remember them, said the Lord. To which the Bavli, the Talmud says, this has nothing to do with the people of Israel. It's talking about the vessels of ministry. And so the Talmud answers, I'll find another scripture. Here you have the flip side of the story, the Babylonian side of the story. Babylonia will look upon itself as being the center of Jewish life throughout the world because it's the center of Torah. And as a, uh, an intellectual center, the one thing an intellectual center cannot um, accept is a brain drain. Is young students leaving that intellectual center and going elsewhere. And elsewhere here happens to be the land of Israel, but it's unacceptable. And now we come to two of my favorite sources. This is a story that is told in both Talmuds, the Babylonian Talmud and the Talmud of the land of Israel. And this is, and I always told my students, when you have a parallel story in two versions, look for the discrepancies, look for the differences. They are the ones that tell you how the different mentalities play themselves out. The story here is about a fellow who comes from the land of Israel. His name is Hananiah. He's the nephew of Rabbi Joshua. He goes to Babylonia in all, in all sorts of strange circumstances. We can't go into that now, but apparently he had some magic spell placed upon him. The spell was removed in the land of Israel, but his uncle tells him, you know what, after this spell, your career here is shot. Go abroad. And so he goes to Babylonia where he does the unthinkable. He begins to intercalate the Jewish calendar. He begins to proclaim Rosh Chodesh, right? And maybe even leap years, or probably leap years uh, as well, and maybe primarily, uh, which was unthinkable at the time because this was considered the prerogative of the rabbis of the land of Israel. And so the Israelis sent him messengers telling him to desist and to take back whatever he's done. They came to Babylonia, these Eretz Israel messengers, and they immediately begin picking fights with him. Everything that he says, they immediately oppose on, on all aspects of halakha. Finally, he, Hananiah, said to them, on what account do I declare unclean and you clean? I forbid and you permit. In other words, why are you picking fights with me on matters of halakha? They said to him, because you intercalate the calendar years and determine months outside the land of Israel. You're, you, you, this usurpation of the centrality of the land of Israel is unacceptable. He answers, I have a precedent for this. He said to them, and did not Akiva ben Joseph do so abroad? There is indeed a Mishnah that describes the famous Rabbi Akiva going to a town in Babylonia, Naharda, and apparently proclaiming uh, the new month. And so he says, what do you want from me? Akiva did this before me. They said to him, according to the Bavli, ignore the case of Rabbi Akiva ben Joseph for he did not leave his equal in the learning in Eretz Yisrael. But by the way, I, I must tell you, I'm convinced that when he said Akiva did this before me, they answered, and this may conjure up in the memories of some of you out there, a very famous vice presidential debate that took place in 1988 uh, in the United States. I'm convinced that when he said, Rabbi Akiva did this before me, they really answered, look, we knew Rabbi Akiva you're not Rabbi Akiva, right? Uh, and those who know what I'm referring to know. I, but the point is, Akiva did this before me. Now look at their answer. Now, this is according to the Babylonian Talmud. They said to him, 
ignore the case of Akiva. He did not leave his equal learning in Eretz Yisrael. In other words, wherever the greatest sage is, that's where the center is. And Akiva, when he went abroad, did not leave his equal in Eretz Yisrael. He said to them, I too did not leave my equal in the land in Eretz Yisrael, right? There's nobody there that can compare with me. They replied, no, there's a new generation. The lambs that you left behind have become rams. Now, read this carefully and you know, know what's going on here. Nobody here claims that the center is Eretz Yisrael. What the claim is that wherever the greatest Torah sage happens to be at any given moment, that's where the center is. In other words, in telling this story, the Babylonian Talmud is basically, and in the end, Hanavi loses the fight, but wins the ultimate battle, because uh, the, the claim is made here uh, as being accepted that wherever the Torah center is, or wherever the greatest Torah authority is, that's the center, which of course, is in a sense a post-Zionistic approach because it says you no longer require land as a center, you require a certain spiritual um, uh, center and authority. Now the same story is told, look, let's scroll down to source number 18, in the Palestinian Talmud in Sanhedrin, right, where the messengers come, but they don't start arguing about where the greatest rabbi is, rather, and I'm going to the middle of the story for lack of time, one of, the, one of the rabbis reads from the Torah, and then his friend gets up and recites from the Haftarah. But of course, rewording the, the words of Isaiah. Rabbi Nathan arose, you see what I underlined here, and completed, he read the Haftarah. For out of Babylonia shall come forth Torah and the word of God from the Har Pekod. Notice what happened here, Zion is missing. This is post-Zionism. You people have really followed a post-Zionist uh, approach. You've removed Zion from the equation. They, whereupon the audience immediately shouts out, they said, for out of Zion shall come Torah, the word of God from Jerusalem. You're, you're, you're misquoting the prophet here. It says Zion. Nathan says to them, by us in Israel, it's for out of Zion shall come forth Torah. You people have restructured, you've reformulated the prophet to read for out of Babylonia. Same story, same Hananya, but look how the Palestinian Talmud tells the story. It has nothing to do with where the greatest scholar is. The whole idea is, right, out of Zion shall come forth Torah. If we scroll down a little further, right, that's it. Uh, the Babylonians, of course, believe that Torah was the center, and they had the upper hand over Israel. That constantly, we were furnishing the Israelis with Torah. For at first, when the Torah was forgotten from Israel, Ezra, beginning of the Second Temple, came up from Babylon and established it. It was again forgotten, and Hillel the Babylonian came up and established it. Again, it was forgotten. Rabbi Kiya and his sons came up, meaning Alu, from Babylonia to the land of Israel and established it. In other words, you Israelis can't get your act together and we in Babylonia, where the center exists, have to constantly support you. So it's, what, I, what I've been trying to show is that in the post-temple uh, period, there slowly develops a, a split some, between two mentalities. One that still maintains that geography is critical and that land and territory is the center of Jewish life. And of course, territory meaning the land of Israel, and Zion in its broader sense, and the other mentality that has reshaped what it meant to be a Jew. A Jew is a Jew of Torah, and one has to seek the greatest concentration of Torah, the greatest authorities of Torah, wherever they might be. If it's in Babylonia, it's in Babylonia, and of course elsewhere, uh, then it will be elsewhere. So we have two totally different re responses, or I should say mentalities, as to the centrality of science. If you look at your source sheet, and we'll end up with this, uh, how did the Khurban really affect Jews? One, and non-Jews as well. Now here I brought three examples of three modern, modern meaning 20th century scholars. One of them is still alive, my good friend Martin Goodman from Oxford. And if you look at his, he has an article, Diaspora Reactions to the Destruction, there were those scholars who claimed that the Jews abroad weren't really affected by the destruction. Yes, so there was no place to send, there was no temple to send money, but basically life went on. However, 
Goodman claims, if you go to the middle uh, of this source here, Goodman claims that the Romans began, as you know, they, uh, they imposed a Jewish tax on Jews everywhere. And the tax was paid not it's interesting, not by you dying, meaning those who come from the land of Israel, but those who live as Jews. And if you look in the middle of this text, the Roman state and Romans in general for the first time came properly to appreciate that people of non-Jewish origin, gay converts, could become Jews. After 96, uh, something takes place with the uh, stringent collection of Jewish taxes. The definition of a Jew by the Roman state was for the purpose of that tax, a religious one. For Romans, Jews were those who worshiped the divinity whose temple had been destroyed and who refused to worship other gods. In other words, what Gooden claims is, for the first time, we begin to encounter a definition of Judaism as being a religion and not a, a, an identity deriving from a land. In other words, Udaioi, right, will no longer mean those who come from the land of Judea, of Judea, but those who live in a particular lifestyle. There were not Jewish historians who would go to a totally different, in a totally different uh, direction. I bring one of them here, Marcel Simon, and it's rather distressing sometimes to read this. He claims that the loss of the temple removed the inequality between Palestinian Jews and those outside of Palestine. For Jewish universalism, the temple was an obstacle and a hindrance. In other words, yes, Philo and Josephus talk about being Amolam, but as long as there's a temple, there's a central land, and, and th that, that's a hindrance to total immersion. It was a forceful reminder of the connection between Jewish religion and territory. In the, now he says it's a statement which I hope many of you will find hard to accept. I do, of course, also. In destroying Jerusalem, the Romans forcibly dissociated the Jewish religion from the Jewish state, or manifestly the former, Judaism continued, whereas the latter did not, that's correct. But now comes his final statement. In this, the Romans in the long run did Judaism a service. In other words, we should thank them for destroying the temple. They enabled the existence of a Jewish uh, religion to, to thrive even after the destruction. Uh, others, I see there are one or two questions here. Uh, it's interesting because a third historian, Gedalia Alon, who taught in Jerusalem, uh, claims none of this is true. The land of Israel would remain central in Jewish life for the next 500 years until the Muslim conquest and the Middle Ages. And he brings here a list of all of those aspects where the Jews and the authorities in the land of Israel still had hegemony over the land of Israel. And so what I've tried to show, and we have a few minutes for questions, what I've tried to show is that the Choban is not just, right, cessation of sacrificial worship in Jerusalem and the necessity of setting up a prayer system, etc., but in fact is a major shift apparently and within the Jewish community to different approaches about where land, now what role does land have in Jewish, uh, in the Jewish psyche, uh, in the Jewish mentality, in Jewish self-definition. And here we saw a major difference between the rabbis of the land of Israel who were responding to what they thought was, quote, post-Zionism and uh, what the Babylonians believed to be the essence of Judaism. And it's not by chance that indeed the Satmar Rebbe in um, defining his anti-Zionist uh, uh, approach in modern times quotes that very same Talmud of Rabbi Zera and Rabbi Yehuda, right, um, th that uh, negates permission for en masse Aliyah to the land of Israel. If there are a few questions here, uh, we have about five minutes for some questions and brief answers. Uh, so Ariel? Several questions. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, let's just take a few. Um, Barbara Friedman is asking, after the destruction of the first temple, did the Babylonians or those in Egypt see the Jews as a religion? The Babylon, meaning non-Jews or Jews? In other words, I, I'm not sure. Uh, when, when Jews in Babylonia say, Al Naharot Bavel Sham Yashavnu Vagam, on the rivers of Babylon, we sat and we weep, remembering Zochreinu et Zion, remembering Zion, they're still attached to territory. 
And the proof, of course, is that with the advent of the Persian Empire, after the Persians defeat the Babylonians, we do have an Aliyah back to the land of Israel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and so on. In other words, they are still attached to the land. What happens to the Jews of Egypt uh, is something else. And that, of course, is connected to the Hellenistic culture, right, and mentality that will be embraced by many Jews, apparently, in the Hellenistic and Roman world, this idea of a globalization, right? One can be part of the local scenery and nevertheless maintain Judaism. By the way, it's not by chance that German Jews of the 19th century embraced Philo as their hero, because for them, Philo was proof you could be a good Jew and nevertheless be a good citizen of the land in which you live, right? So for them, it would be, of course, German culture, which is the, the equal uh, as the culture that confronted Philo. So there is this identity of sorts between non-Zionist Jews of the 19th century and what I call post-Zionist Jews to an extent of the first century. Another question? Um, um, I'll take one more question. This next question comes from Joel Ackerman. Um, he asked this question in the beginning of your lecture. And he's asking, if there wasn't a mass dispersion after 70, why does everyone think there was? And what's the basis for this? OK. Um, first of all, it's a reflection back in time. In other words, our prayers, many of them, uh, were written some years later. But even those that weren't uh, know that there are Jews everywhere and try to attribute this right large diaspora to a sin that was, in other words, because of our sins, we were exiled from our land, right? So there's a cause and result here, and people imagine that uh, something must have happened at a particular time. But we have tremendous, I have to say, I wrote a few books about this, right? We have an enormous amount of information about Jews who live in the land of Israel, right? Uh, and I said, Gedalia Alon's Enterprise, the whole idea of that the Jews in their land is the title of his book, is to show that there's a thriving community in the land of Israel for centuries after the destruction. It's not only archaeology. We have Roman sources, we have Christian sources, and Jewish sources that all talk about a very large and, and as I say, assertive Jewish community in the land of Israel. So we, we should put off this dispersion until uh, a few centuries after the Khurban. 